Bravo. Hello and welcome to PlayStation Grenade. Borderlands 3 brings us four brand spanking new vault hunters to choose from on our trek around the galaxy. Zane, Moe, Amara and Flack. Over the past few months I've been lucky enough to play them all and I thought I'd mention a few things to help you decide which vault hunter is best for you. Before we start, you need to know that there is no wrong choice here. There is no bad decision. You're gonna love Borderlands 3 regardless of which Vault Hunter you choose. They're all complete OP wrecking balls. By the end of the video, we should pick our characters and I'm hoping you'll write yours in the comments below and more importantly, tell us why you chose that character. I really wanna know what makes them great to you. I've broken this video into sections, each one listed in the description below, so you can decide which element is more important to you. First we'll give a character bio for each of the hunters and where they link in with lore of Borderlands. Then we'll look at how they interact with the world and their voice acting. The next step will be to go through their skills and unique abilities and there's a few annoyances which could impact your decision so I'll put those in too. And finally we'll look at how they impact play in co-op or solo. There is so much to get through so if you're ready, let's do this! Next level. If a character's backstory is key to your decision and how they fit in with lore, this section is for you. Meet Amara, who's a siren. Amara is a tough SOB who is itching for a fight. I mean, the first thing her character bio has her say is this. I'm always looking for a fight. A fight for justice. A fight for what's right. Amara is super aggressive, and with that comes a confidence we rarely see in female video game protagonists. Even the queen of the female lead characters, Lara Croft, always has the air of self-doubt to overcome. Whereas Amara is 100% dedicated to her work and just wants to punch people in the name of doing the right thing. Amara has the deepest link to Borderlands lore due to her siren status. Sirens are the most powerful creatures in the Borderlands universe. Their powers are mythic. But here's the thing, there can only be six sirens in existence at any one time. And another thing, all sirens are female. Sirens can be easily identified by their tattoo-like markings around their arms and torso. Thus far, we know of six women to be classified as sirens. Angel, who died in the previous game. Commandant Steel, who died in a previous game. The next three are Maya from Borderlands 2, Lilith, the leader of the Crimson Raiders, the faction we belong to in Borderlands 3, and of course, Amara, the playable siren in Borderlands 3. And finally, Tyrene Calypso, who is our arch enemy this time around. Let's not go too far down this rabbit hole, but know that sirens are pivotal to the story being told in Borderland 3. If you want a front row seat, choose Amara. From a law standpoint, she's the right pick. Next up is Zane. How can I quickly get his character across? Imagine Han Solo and Boba Fett put into the same character with Colin Farrell's Irish accent. Zane's history spans the galaxy. He attended the same assassin school as Zero from Borderlands 2, but he's also aligned himself on both sides of the law in the past. He's completely untrustworthy and prefers his own company to that of others, and is happy to take on any work he can, making his moral compass difficult to read at best. Rest assured though, in Borderlands 3, he's a good guy through and through. Zane could be the new Merc with a mouth. From a law standpoint, Zane's surname may ring a bell or two, Flint. Zane has two brothers we've already met. Baron Flint was a bandit, well, Baron, <laughs> we fought and killed in the original Borderlands. Then in Borderlands 2, we took on Captain Flint, who has an addiction to torturing people. We killed him too, by the way. Come to think of it, does Zane know he's working for the organization that murdered both of his brothers? That could be an awkward conversation. Character 3 is Mose, a former soldier who's fought in many wars. The story is quite sorrow filled. Her final mission drew close Darzaran Bay. Completing this task would result in her earning the mech she fights in as severance pay as she left the war behind her. But it turns out that Mose and her unit were sent to an impossible mission. They were sent to die. Their last mission saw a skyscraper toppled on top of their heads. Somehow though, Moe's survived. Now she's off the grid. She's battle hardened and ready for a fight with her mech. Moe's decides to become a vault hunter. Her connections to the Borderlands lore are through her association with the world's most well-known gun manufacturer, Vladov. The Vladov brand is designed to mimic Russian military conventions, with the company looking to arm rebels and enemy forces to its competitors. It's even implied that Moe's and her unit were deliberately killed by their employers to prevent them from switching sides after they left the military. This may even be a story beat in the game. And finally, Flak, or Flakfork, Flakfork. 
Uh, anyway, by far Flack is the hardest to sum up on this list. And there's no links to Lore either. He's an emergent AI. So should I say they are an emergent AI? She she is an emergent it is an emer Do you know what? I really don't care. As long as Flack is a badass character, I couldn't give a sh Flack is Borderlands' first Beastmaster. Somehow, Flack is able to communicate with the world's creatures and persuade them to follow his lead. He uses a pack mentality, which means there is an alpha animal who controls the herd's actions, but ultimately, he's a hunter with a pet. I've tried my best to tie in the lore to him, but I can't. I can't find anything. So arguably, Flack is the perfect character to choose if you're completely new to the Borderlands series. So now we have a basis to work from, character histories. So let's move on to interactions. Borderlands 3 has given Vault Hunters far more lines than they ever had before. And although they are inserted into the exact same conversations, they all vary massively. And remember, you'll be stuck with that character's voice for around 35 hours. So if you're not too fond of it, it's best to know that from minute one. Here's what all the Vault Hunters sound like. What's your name? You are allowed to call me Flack until I decide if I'm going to kill you. Thanks. What's your name? Amara. Thanks. What's your name? Mose, Gunner First Class, ex Vladoff Mechanized Infantry. Thanks. Amara seems to be short and to the point. She doesn't seem to give away much of her character in terms of emotion. She's more sassy as the game progresses, but from what I've played, she speaks the least. Here's another example of how Amara is short and swift with her responses. How to take down Gigamind. That is our mission. Is this Gigamind something I could punch? Now compare that same scenario with Zane. That is our mission. Gigamind! Of course! I know it well. Mind explaining for anyone who doesn't, though? Not, not me, of course. The difference is night and day. Character interactions play a huge part in Borderlands 3. From my time with Zane, I can say that his lapsidaisical responses will always grab your attention, whereas Amara's sometimes just pass you by without you realising. So what's your crazy deal? Mose is quite military focused due to her background, but that becomes less prominent as the character evolves. Cool. Dig all of that. I'm supposed to give you a message? Flack's responses are more amusing than you would think from an objective AI, supposedly without emotion. His desire to hunt comes across regularly, but in terms of character, he's like Teal'c from Stargate. Is that reference far too old? Your clan is dead. Tyrene Calypso slaughtered them. It was unnatural. He's very matter of fact, but he's got lots of charisma too. I mean, check out how he speaks to the game's sexiest character, Ellie. Hey, what are you staring at, hun? Most humans are frail and weak, but you've got admirable heft, girl. Ain't you a heartbreaker? So, we now know the character's history. We know how they talk and interact with the world. So let's move on to something which really impacts your decision. Each hunter has drastically different skills which affect your playstyle. The only skill they all share is shooting a billion guns. Here's how the abilities change your game. As a note, there are too many passive perks to go through, like increased accuracy, limiting cooldowns or upping damage, you know, that sort of thing. So we'll just concentrate on the ones which are very different from each other. So back to Amara. Let's go through her siren abilities. Her three action skills can be changed on the fly, but she can only equip one at any point. Her first ability is Phase Slam, in which Amara jumps in the air and smashes to the ground like a superhero landing, creating an area of effect damage zone, great for taking out groups of foes. The splash damage of this move can be buffed to make it even wider, and it's also possible to change the element used, like this lovely corrosive green. As her skills level up and upgrade, Amara learns to summon fists to fracture the ground in front of her, and it's even possible for Amara to fire an elemental beam at the ground before she lands that slam. Face Slam has a cooldown of 26 seconds in between uses. Her second ability is Phase Cast, which allows Amara to throw out an astral projection of herself, and it literally flies straight as an arrow through enemies in its path. It's wider than you think, picking up collateral damage on limbs and any part of the enemy which touches its vicinity. The distance, strength, and how it passes through cover can all be upgraded in the skill tree, with one cool perk which gives Amara and allies health for successful phase casts. Perfect for co-op play. 
The standard cooldown is 22 seconds in between uses. Amara's final ability is Phase Grasp, which is ridiculous fun. Amara summons a giant fist, which holds an enemy in place unable to move. This is great to use on boss-like characters to deal huge damage while they are helpless. As a basis, the hold lasts for 7 seconds and then there's a 13 second cooldown before we can use it again. The skill can be converted to solar or fire damage if you prefer, and as it's upgraded, more fists join the party, allowing more enemies to be grabbed, and one perk even allows us to shoot one enemy and all the other ones take the same damage from it. Pretty damn cool. Of course there are gives and takes to all these skills and for every Vault Hunter actually, cooldowns change as attacks become more OP. But one thing for sure, you feel like a complete badass playing as Amara. Next up is Zane. Here's something to know right away about this Irishman. He can have two abilities active at the same time. No other Vault Hunter can do this. It's so damn good, it really is. But the problem is, if you choose two abilities, he loses his grenades. They're completely gone. And as you can tell by my channel name, grenades are important to me. So is it worth it? Well, well, yes, check this out. Zane can summon a sentinel drone which continuously flies around the battlefield and automatically attacks enemies with its mounted machine guns. By pressing L2 and R2 together, the drone will target whoever Zane is looking at. At first, the damage isn't great, but as you would expect, this can be upgraded through the skill trees. At its base, Sentinel is a 60 second skill, 24 seconds in the air before 36 seconds of cooldown between uses. The skill tree here is very interesting as the passive skills include the ability to swap weapons quicker and increase the damage in different ways. The drone can also be specced for cryo damage and lifesteal is here too, allowing Zane to regain health from enemies. Zane's second skill is Digiclone. Just as the name suggests, a clone is digistructed and stays in place. He fires at enemies and those enemies will focus on the clone instead of the real Zane who can be moving around at this point. This skill is so good for getting out of tight fights on low health. Zane can then switch places with the clone at any point, almost like having two characters at the same time. A one-man flanking manoeuvre. It's like an instant teleport too. I used this in a boss fight in which the weak spot was on his back. With the Digiclone, the boss would focus on him, and then the real Zane would creep round the back and shoot him up the arse. At first, the clone lasts 18 seconds with a 26 second cooldown in between uses. One of the upgrades allows Zane and the clone to be awarded an increased magazine size. Perfect for going up against multiple enemies. Finally, Zane's last skill is a defensive barrier that lasts 9 seconds initially and then cools down for 18 seconds before we can pop it again. The greatest thing about this ability is that we can shoot through this barrier. The whole squad can shoot out of the shield, but the bandits can't shoot through it. One of the standout perks gives Zane and allies increased maneuverability and fire rate for a short time after touching that shield. And on the flip side, a deterrence field can be unlocked which passes shock damage to enemies who touch the shield. Freaking awesome, isn't it? Oh, and earlier when I said no grenades if you use two skills simultaneously, well, when the drone is upgraded, it will randomly drop nades on enemies and the clone will leave a nade behind when it's destroyed. Grenade for life! Next, let's break down Moe's. Even though Moe's has three skill trees, they're all really just one to summon the mech known as the Iron Bear. But each of those trees comes down to how you want to spec the bear. Moe's can opt for a semi-automatic grenade launcher to be added, a rail gun that makes high velocity shock bolts, or a minigun for sustained rapid fire. All unbelievably fun to use. Upgrades, as you'd expect, are all about damage and decreasing the cooldown of the mech and increasing how long it's in the fight for. The Iron Bear can be specced out perfectly for every single battle. For example, taking on a huge number of enemies spec towards a wider damage effect. Focusing on a single target, the railgun will obliterate them. It may seem as if Moe's is a two-dimensional character, but this class, for those who want it, is the perfect weaponized tank. Oh, and the greatest upgrade of all? A second seat for your teammate to jump in. This is so much fun in cooperative. So many laughs to be had when playing in co-op. And finally, the enigma that is Flak. Flak has three pets to choose from, a Skag, a Jabba, or a Spider Ant. Flak can only choose one though. Making the decision can be down to the skill trees, or more realistically, which one looks cutest to you. The skill trees, although they're linked to the pet, you can technically pick one pet and spec a different tree. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it is possible. But realistically, each pet has its own skill tree, which sees them evolve and become highly skilled killing machines. 
The way evolution works is, is really fun. The Jabba skill tree first gives the little monkey lion thing a pistol, but through evolution he becomes a beefcake Jabba and the pistol is changed out for a shotgun. Then later in the skill tree the Jabba becomes a gunslinger with an SMG to mess up your enemies. And at that level the Jabba also gets a rocket launcher. Things are crazy in this skill tree. The Jabba can also be spec to res you if you're knocked down in battle. The same skill tree gives Flak another ability, an invisibility cloak, just like in the Predator movies. While cloaked, Flak can fire three shots, which, regardless of where they hit, will be awarded critical bonuses for additional damage. There's a few different ways to spec the invisibility cloak. For example, you could technically play in a stealthy way and avoid enemies up until the boss battles. The Hunter Tree focuses on the Spider Ant, but Flak's ability in this line is a rack attack, sending out a flying beast to attack enemies. The Spider Ant can be upgraded to be a Scorcher, which adds incendiary damage to your pet, and its final evolution is a Countess, allowing the Spider Ant to burrow under the ground, then when it emerges, it will drop a corrosive area of effect to decimate bandits. The final skill tree gives us a Skag as a pet, which will throw up acid on command. Lovely. Flak's ability allows him to teleport the pet, gifting it radiation damage. So if the Skag has run too far away, bring him back with this teleportation trick. After evolution, the Skag can rush enemies and flip them into the air. And the final evolution allows the Skag to drag all enemies closer to him using a singularity pulse. It's interesting, isn't it? There are so many small changes which impact gameplay within all these skill trees, but I think our heads would explode if we went any further into this right now. Hopefully though, one of these characters grabs your attention and you're one step closer to choosing your first Vault Hunter in Borderlands 3. Next level. Okay, as a side point, there are a few things I think you should be aware of which can be annoying and put you off certain characters. But don't worry, nothing's game breaking, but it can frustrate you at times, so I thought at least I'd let you know. Flax pets, they're freaking awesome, yeah, I love them, but the problem is when you're interacting with NPCs or trying to get yourself into the story, they walk around the scene and become a distraction. Worst of all though can be the audio shrieks that they let out for no reason at all. Hopefully they're patched out, but to me the worst thing was the way they clip through objects, or frustratingly of all, clip through the person you are talking to. Like I say, it's not game breaking, but definitely bloody annoying if you're trying to get yourself into the story and immersion is your thing. Next is Moe's and her mech. Frustratingly, the mech can get stuck in places. It happens, it's one of those things. Or there won't be enough room to actually use it mid-fight. That's annoying too. But the only thing I really want to say is that there are worlds with bridges with small gaps. Seemingly too small for a 10-foot mech to fit through. But no, a 2-foot gap can see the Iron Bear fall into the abyss. Being stuck then falling to your death can be super aggravating. To my knowledge, I haven't seen any issues with Amara or Zane, but please note, they're, they're not big deals, these things. They're just slightly immersion-breaking issues which cause frustrations. I think they're all forgivable, but personally, those pets running around was so annoying, <laughs> so that put me off black. And finally, if you're planning to play solo or cooperatively, there are certain builds and hunters which will be perfect for you. Of course, all hunters are great in both scenarios, but here's a few things to note. Solo players, you should consider Flak as the strongest option due to his pets. It's ultimately like playing duos with an AI. That way, you don't have to talk to real people. Also, by selecting the Jabba skill tree, he can be upgraded to automatically res Flak if he is downed. The pets can also gain aggro, allowing Flak to escape, and the evolutions of the pets make them so OP, Flak is perfect for solo play. Almost all of his perks apply to him and not really his allies. Even though I do recommend him for solo play, two Flaks playing together with two pets running around makes this game ridiculously easy. On the other hand, a character which is perfect for duo play is Moe's, primarily due to the Iron Bear mech and the ability to add a second seat for another Vault Hunter to jump in. The way she can spec her weapons allows for interesting builds which can cover allies with the barrage of different splash damages whilst using highly directable weapons for DPS stage when her partner has the aggro of a boss. Moe's has a staggering amount of adjustments to suit cooperative play. In solo, she lacks defensive options and maneuvering items, but still great fun in solo. But I'd have to say it's a little harder to play as Moe's, so if you want a challenge, pick Moe's in solo play. And then we have Amara and Zane, who both have attributes which help in solo and cooperative play. Amara is slightly more solo focused due to her aggressive actions, but due to her links with the storyline and being a siren, she's always a great option at every single opportunity. Which leads me to Zane. 
Zane's two active abilities offer team play extensive benefits. The flying drone to watch over allies, the digiclone to allow for quick teleportation to cover your teammate, and the shield barrier which allows allies to shoot through without taking damage. All perfect for co-op play. On the flip side, the same skills when specced right can make Zane unbeatable in solo play. The clone offers a way to flank enemies safely, the shield keeps snipers at bay in intense battles, and the drone is that extra touch of safety needed when playing alone. If Zane uses the drone and clone technology at the same time, it's like having three players shooting simultaneously, rewarded with massive DPS. This video has been far too long, so let's cut this here. Who the heck are you going to pick? I realised when I was about midway through this video that I've already chosen. I'm going to pick Zane, the Irish Han Solo of Borderlands. Of course, that's only one man's thoughts. Who is the right Vault Hunter for you? I'd really love to know. I'll be looking in the comments to see who you guys prefer, and more importantly, why you chose that Vault Hunter. Hopefully this video was helpful. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I'm Adam from PlayStation Grenade. I'll see you next time.